Welcome back to Sidebar here on Law & Crime. I'm Anjanette Levy. Two weeks ago, we told you about that horrifying video from a daycare in Mississippi where some daycare workers were purposely scaring young children, toddlers, by wearing a scary Halloween mask. We didn't know at the time whether or not criminal charges would be filed. We thought maybe, maybe not, maybe charges are not appropriate. Well, guess what? Now five people related to this video are facing criminal charges, some of them felony child abuse. Let's take a look at another little look at that video. You've been good. Don't get hurt. I got you. You've been good. No. So, so. No. Bad, bad. Are you being bad? You want me to take you outside? Discuss this is former prosecutor Florina Altschiller. Uh, we discussed this two weeks ago, Florina. I'm glad to have you back on to talk about it again. Uh, your reaction to these people, some of these workers being charged with felony child abuse. Uh, Sierra McCandless is facing three counts of felony child abuse. Ossiana Kilburn, three counts of felony child abuse. Jennifer Newman, three counts of felony child abuse. Cheyenne Mills, three counts of felony child abuse. These are the people at the daycare. And then Tracy Houston faces a failure to report abuse by a mandatory reporter and simple assault. She is the daycare operator who would be uh, required to report this under the law. So your reaction to hearing about these specific criminal charges, especially the felonies? My thought is that they're overcharged. I think that their behavior is grossly inappropriate. I think that seeing those videos is shocking. Uh, I think that none of those employees have any business working with a vulnerable population, such as young children. And I think that that daycare center should absolutely be held civilly liable to the parents of those children. But when we look at felony criminal charges, we're talking about serious prison time. And we're talking about having to meet the elements of those crimes based on the facts. And the problem that I have here is one of the elements that needs to be met is substantial harm causing intentionally or recklessly substantial harm to those children. And while it does not need to be physical harm, it would need to be substantial emotional harm. And what we're talking about is cases where somebody rapes a child, someone who sexually molests a child, children who are substantially emotionally harmed and likely scarred for the rest of their lives. I think in this situation, the children were absolutely traumatized, but I really don't believe that these are the kind of acts that are similar to what people do when they molest children, when they beat children, when they cause significant substantial harm to children that unfortunately lasts for the rest of their lives. 
So Florina, how do you go about proving this though? Because of the harm you're talking about. I mean, they would I assume talk about, you know, or at least have people assess these children, a psychologist or psychiatrist, probably a psychologist, and then get testimony from the parents about how this has impacted the children. I mean, can you see a way where they can prove the charge if there's proof that there is psychological damage to these children? Absolutely. Um, they would need an expert to testify that as a result of these daycare workers uh, scaring these children during this incident, that these children are now substantially emotionally harmed, traumatized, and are going to have lasting effects. Is that possible? Yes, of course it's possible. And that's why those charges were filed. But I really think the problem here is you have to treat similarly situated people equally under the law. And this is not the type of felony child abuse case that's similar or equal to what we typically see in felony child abuse cases, which is either physical abuse or sexual abuse. We see cases where children are molested, cases where children are beaten, cases where children are physically tortured, and felony child abuse charges in those cases are absolutely appropriate. Unfortunately, while this is vile, this is graphic, this is disturbing, this is emotionally upsetting, I don't believe that it rises to the level of felony child abuse. And my concern is in filing these charges, they're opening the door for a lot of cases where people take it a step too far and perhaps inflict emotional damage to a child uh, to be charged with felony level child abuse. Now, I think that we have to ask the question here uh, that's something you and I discussed offline. Uh, the fact that this is something that went viral, right? So there's uh, probably a lot of pressure on the Monroe County law enforcement officials in charge of this, including the sheriff, possibly. Uh, maybe a lot of pressure to do something. You know, the reaction from the community was very strong. People around the country who've seen this video are horrified by it and disgusted, rightfully so. So uh, I notice on the press release from the Monroe County Sheriff, it says, you know, basically the felony charges will be presented to the grand jury next and it will be decided there if there's enough individuals or enough evidence rather to indict these individuals on these charges. So the next step, the next hurdle is the grand jury. You know, there's that old saying, you can indict a ham sandwich, right? It doesn't take much to get an indictment. So do you think that maybe some politics and some pressure may have been at play here? Yeah, that's a great question, Jeanette. And, you know, you were one of the first to really break this story and bring attention to it. And that's what does need to happen is in society, right? When we see a harm or a wrong or something that's outrageous, it's important to bring attention to it. I think the problem becomes when we bring attention to something and we react emotionally and we are so upset by what happened that we're basically, you know, showing up with, with pitchforks saying off with their heads. And that's where it goes too far. The law has to be applied equally and it has to be applied fairly without sympathy for or against somebody who's charged and without an emotional reaction. And I think that's where that balance is very difficult to achieve because when we see young children being taken advantage of, when we see a vulnerable population being abused, we want the highest charges possible. We want people held accountable. But the law has to be applied fairly and it has to be applied where it actually applies. And I think here, perhaps, there's an overreaction by the sheriff's office and by the local district attorney's office that's responsive to the widespread media attention for a story that has now gone national. And so the DA's office doesn't want to fail to act. They feel pressure to take action. So is there a chance that something happens at grand jury? Uh, if you're a prosecutor and you look at this and you go into the grand jury room and grand jury proceedings are secret, of course, uh, do you go into the grand jury room? And I mean, as a prosecutor, when you're presenting to grand jury, you kind of recommend charges and then the grand jurors are allowed to question you about that, right? 
Absolutely. Um, but it is exceptionally rare for a prosecutor to go into a grand jury and recommend that there be no true bill. Um, they would simply just not present it to the grand jury. So I expect that if the prosecution is presenting their case, they're presenting it asking for an indictment. That being said, the grand jury may find that there is not sufficient evidence for those charges. Or what is more likely to happen is if the prosecution presents this to the grand jury and it does get indicted, there may still be a plea deal that is worked out or perhaps a plea deal worked out before the case is presented to the grand jury. However, the impediment here is going to be the great national media attention and social pressure for this DA's office to, you know, enforce the full extent of the law and hold these people accountable. And my concern here is holding them accountable is not holding them fairly proportionately accountable based on the gravity of the situation. What I think is interesting too, uh, the owner of the daycare was not charged, but you know, somebody in charge there was because they're a mandatory reporter. So if you're a mandatory reporter, just briefly, uh, Florina, if you're a mandatory reporter and you don't report something like this because you think, oh, it was wrong, but it wasn't child abuse, are you really in trouble? Well, I think that the mandatory reporting charge is appropriate here because objectively speaking, when you see something like this, I don't think anybody can see this and say, oh, that's cool. They're just playing a joke, right? I, it's inappropriate. It is not age appropriate. It is not appropriate for somebody that's in a position of power over these children. And it's not appropriate for a daycare center with employees who are supposed to be properly trained to work with children to act in that manner. So all of the workers really who did not participate but observed this happening should be charged for failing to report because they should hold each other accountable and that is the purpose of mandatory reporting. And is this child abuse? On on a level, it is. I just personally don't believe that it's felony level child abuse. Well, Florina Altschiller, a former prosecutor, thanks as always for coming on to talk about this and anything else. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me and thanks for bringing this story to everyone's attention. And that's it for this edition of Law and Crime Sidebar Podcast. It is produced by Logan Harris and Sam Goldberg. Bobby Zoki is our YouTube manager. Alyssa Fisher handles our bookings. And Kiera Bronson does our social media. You can download and listen to Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, and wherever else you get your podcasts. You can also watch it on Law and Crime's YouTube channel. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we'll see you next time.